I'm a soldier in the army. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army. Put me on the front line in the army of the Lord. Put me on the front line in the army of the Lord. Put me on the front line in the army of the Lord. of the Lord, got my walkers on in the army of the Lord, got my sword and shield 
in the army of the Lord. Got my sword and shield in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Soldier in the army of the Lord.
God blessings to all of you. Good having you with us on the broadcast again. As we continue in the series, another portion, second portion of it, of our series of 12. So bow your heads with me if you would. Thank you again for being with us on the broadcast. Let's pray. My Father, thank you for your unmeasurable love and your grace. We pray for your aid of the Holy Spirit now to make known the truth revealed in your word, all of you and none of me. Be it so now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, we had been talking on the what it means to be in battle and against and how to win against the, the angry dragon. We're referencing from 
Revelations chapter 12, verse 7. There's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fight against the dragon. The dragon and his angel fought. And their places were found no more in heaven. They were kicked out. There are a number of scriptures we talked about in reference to the last time we talked. One of those scriptures was from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, and neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Another scripture we reference were 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. About God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. Yea, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And of course, the third scripture I believe that came up was referencing from Psalms 1 and 2. A portion of that scripture says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. We were talking about the battle in the sense of when God created everything and after his creation was done in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31, it declares that what all that he had done and it was very good when he had completed his work of the creation, it was very good. What we're getting across is from the battle what we've seen take place in Revelation an angry devil no longer in an eternal state he has lost his place he's kicked out into the earth he's very angry we hear what Revelation 12 and 12 states rejoice ye heavens heaven is happy to get rid of the enemy now Although heaven is happy to get rid of the enemy, rejoice ye heaven. And then we hear the, the, the angel declare, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth. As we talked last time, the power and the authority is given to the enemy through rebellion. So, which means every, on this earth, this is part of the laws, part of the rules, part of the guideline which governs the outcome of this world. Every body whom the, the enemy uses has to operate in rebellion. He cannot operate with people who are obedient to principles of God. Every person who aligns with the enemy has to operate in rebellion. And it is that rebellion and arrogance and pride is how and by what means the enemy uses to wreck the world. He cannot do it by himself. He needs help. And the people he enlists in his army to fight this battle, the people that he enlists in his army are those people whom God has created, but they have bought the lies of the enemy and chooses to operate in rebellion. Those are the only people of whom the enemy can use. And those are the ones that he tricks. And those are the ones that ends up by in strong delusions. And those who are eventually because of their persistence in rebellion, the Lord steps back and let them have their choice. And the outcome is what the mess we see here in this world today. We had mentioned earlier, it was mentioned in scripture, Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 very simple law and we see God gave a simple law to man where he says of the tree this of all the, the rules here one tree and we use an analogy very similar to if somebody was given guidelines and say listen this bottle is has a secure lid on it but it is under extreme pressure and what's inside is dangerous. Do not open the lid because the day you open the lid, it is, it, you will die. It, it's, it's injurious, but everything else is here is yours. 
So oftentimes, I, I use the analogy of an angry devil being cast out. He loses his place. He's taken out of an eternal state and he's put in a time state now. Think about it. Man in the garden, originally, he has the propensity to live forever. He has the propensity, long as he is obedient, as long as he's following the rules of God, he has the propensity to never die. He has the propensity to operate in an eternal state. But through his rebellion, through his, of course, it was deception, but still he rebelled. And through that re rebellion, it brought about, took him out of the ability to be in an eternal state and put him in a time state. And in that time state is already the connection broken from God. He's literally, spiritually dead. And we see the everlasting mercy. We see the mercy and the grace of God. So loved the world, he chooses to breathe life back into man. What do I mean by life? Through the principles of things provided for him. And although for years, for millennials, it was a temporary provision, but what was coming on the scene was going to be a permanent provision. And the temporary provision started with the Lord God providing coats of, in other words, clothing made of skin to cover man from his nakedness after he became exposed. And what we see afterward is in the fullness of time we see take place in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, actually chapter 2, verse 8, the, the scripture talks about the prince of this world had they known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had the enemy known by crucifixion of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, had he known this was going to really cre create some problem in his reign here on the earth was his intent to wreck the earth. If he knew this was going to bring about his demise, he would never have never have fallen into that trap. And it was, now, when I say this trap he fell into, it's very interesting because Isaiah mentioned, mentioned about it, though he comes in the volume of the book. So the rules are in the book. Even for our, our life, the rules is in the book. So the goal of the enemy is for us to never read the book. So we see the breaking of that one law, that one rule took place in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw the tree, it was good for food and pleasant to the eyes. And she took up the fruit thereof and gave it to her husband. And he also ate. So both became transgressors. It's like removing the lid off the bottle secure lid off of the bowel, which is under extreme pressure, is very similar to that. And the world has never been the same since. And it allowed the, the devil, which have great wrath, cast out of heaven. And he has come down having great wrath because he knows he only has but a short time. We mentioned to be, has the ability to be in an eternal state and now he's in a time state. There is an expiration date on this part of it. We'll walk through portions of that as we, we will look at, certainly reflect in certain parts of that in Isaiah chapter 14. And also we will take a look at parts of that in Ezekiel 28. And we also mentioned here from Isaiah chapter 59 verse 19. And what it mentioned here, a portion of that scripture talks about, it mentions when the enemy comes in like a flood, that the Lord would lift up a standard against him. With all of, as angry as the enemy is, he still has to abide by certain rules and guidelines. There is angry if he loves to just destroy without limit, without recourse, without, without any kind of restrictions at all. The, the Lord has put some guideline in places that even though, yes, I mean, it is imperative for us to not live by time and chance. 
every person who is in agreement has a covenant with God and will abide by that covenant do not do not have to live and will not be living by time and chance but will live under promise and not only live under promise but is empowered to be able to change and direct the course of their own life Psalm 119 109 puts it this way my life is in my own hand but yet I look into your law so what he's saying is Everything I need to extend my life and to have a joyous life, to have a life which is full, to have a life which is of peace, comes through acknowledging the rules and the guidelines which the Lord has placed before. So what we see here in Isaiah chapter 59 and 19, there are rules. Angry devil cast out of heaven, rules is, is imposed upon him. And without those rules, so although he were cast to the earth, and the warning is woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because the devil has, has come down having great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. Although he's mad, he's angry, yet he's limited. And it took man, it took the help from man to unleash this devil to create the carnage we're seeing here in this world. And it was the love of God as we see from John chapter 3 verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and when his son came on the scene whoa the angry devil his goal was to take him out and of course at least that's why we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 8 what he thought in the flesh okay this is fair game because we can take him out here we're done. We can have we can have the earth. We can have it. However, he was outdone because it, he is the one that liveth and was dead, and behold, he is alive forevermore and has the keys of hell and death. And he legally took ownership. First Adam, we, we lost everything. Now the second Adam comes on the scene in the way of the very word of God come in the flesh. And by him doing so, gives us an opportunity to choose. And whenever we choose to allow him, him in our life, he empowers us. And that's another part of the fight we will talk about. So yes, the angry devil comes, he can't do anything, he needs help. And man unloose the secure lid on this bottle of extreme pressure and lets him out. And of course, the world has never been the same from the time the enemy has been let out. And yes, he do has, he has an expiration date. So his goal is to do all the damage that he possibly can in the short time span that he has. Do not matter whether he's here for 3,000 years or 4,000, 5,000, 5 millennials, 6 millennials. What is that compared, compared to what he's lost? No longer citizenship, no longer an office, no longer a place. And a third of the angels were cast out with him as well. They were deceived in believing they could impede a plan or a manifestation of what God had, had envisioned for the earth. They thought they could impede such and try to intercept what was taking place. As John saw this, he said, this great mystery in heaven. And he saw one closed in the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars the arrogance of the enemy and the pride of the enemy to believe that he could intercept and stop and prevent stop kill and to impede something that god is, is bringing about and manifesting so and obviously the outcome of that and for the enemy was not good and so the enemy was badly beaten and of course his angels were badly beaten also all of them lost their citizenship all of them lost their place all of them who had uh, worked alongside the the dragon got cast out and cast out to the earth and of course the scripture makes it very plain who this dragon is the old serpent the devil and satan whatever name you whatever name might be used is still referencing to the very same person one of the other scriptures we talked about was Proverbs 4 and 7. And 
it mixes with all of your getting, getting an understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing, but with all of your getting, getting under, get, get understanding, with all of your getting, wisdom is the principal thing, but with all your getting, get an understanding. It's when our eyes, it's when the mind, when our heart become open to understand, everything in our life changes. So uh, we understand the power of the enemy is to deceive by our ignorance or by what we don't know. And Hosea 4 and 6 tells us that we are destroyed daily because of a lack of knowledge. And of course we see in Isaiah chapter 5, 5 verse 13 mention about Israel being in captivity and they didn't have to be. And of course that is the goal of the enemy for us to be in the battle and not knowing, not being able to fight or not fighting because we still feel like we're slaves and God has empowered us. So we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 8, had the enemy known, no way in the world would he have, would he have crucified the Lord of glory. If he knew it was going to bring his reign, if it was going to really weaken his, his hold, and if he had any idea, he would have never done it. So one of the things that we see here, the Psalms in Psalms 34 and 19, it talks about many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. And I believe Psalms 34 and 17 tell us that when the righteous cry of the Lord heareth and delivereth out of all their troubles, so the thing of it is, even in the battle that we mentioned, there is a difference. We don't have to just be satisfied. We'll, when we use John chapter 15, verse 7, you abide in me and my word abide in you. So it means something when you accept Christ into your life, which creates a real problem for the enemy. When he lose that part of the battle, all of his focus then shifts on you not coming to know him. As Matthew chapter 11 verse 29 says in the last part of that verse, learn of me. So the goal of the enemy is he will do everything possible so that you will never learn of him. And how do he do that? He do it through offering a million or more different distractions. Everything in the world he will try to offer you so that you never allow the word as he pointed out again in John 15 and 7, you abide in me and my word abide in you. You can ask what you will. Not it might be, but it shall be. So the goal of the enemy is for us to not let his word be. The goal, his goal is let's make sure that the all out fight is so we never become submerged in his word. That we never come to, because he is, think about it, he is the word made flesh. When we become submersed in his word, this is a place where we progress to, not just from righteousness to holiness. Holiness is some, not some special accolades that we beat somebody over the head with. It's not even for the, for the recognition of somebody giving you accolades, but it has to do with your progression and spiritual growth where you become submerged in the word and you're able to use all the tools which are made available for you, which was already paid for by the blood of Jesus. This is the way I really, like, that's why he says, be ye holy as I am holy. So when we have reached a level of maturity where we become submerged in the word, then we see the full manifestation of what John 15 and seven says, you abide in me, and my word abide in you, you can ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done. So the battle is on for the enemy. Uh, the battle is on for him to make sure you never become totally submersive. Because when you become totally submersive in him through his word, where it's not just hearing, but you be, it becomes, you shape your life based on the concepts and the principles of the, of the word of God. And as it is in you, that's why he says, if you abide in me, my word abide in you, you can ask whatsoever you will. Can you imagine the enemy? His goal is to make sure you never get to that point. So, 
So that's why it says many are the affliction of the righteous. Psalm 34 and 19 says it. Many are the affliction of the righteous. So while we're in that process and we've become satisfied rather than reaching the level of maturity, rather than being strong in the Lord. And being strong in the Lord is basically was that point where we, we become submersive in the word of God. And the word has shaped our whole dynamics, our whole being. And it is that place where, where we are able to withstand all the wiles of the enemy. Of course, now we see where the scripture tells, it sets the principle, be it to you according to your faith. There are those that believe, okay, there's a place where you become comfortable, no need to progress on. These are the righteous people. These are the ones that go through many, and there are various levels of affliction. When it says many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. And why does he deliver? Because the righteous cry, and that's Psalm 34 and 17. Whenever the righteous cry, the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. So the beauty of it is, even though the righteous may not fully know why all the ills is happening, but thank God they at a they're humble enough or they at a place where they can they're not operating in rebellion, they can cry out, Lord. I mean, they can cry out, God help, and the Lord do help. So the the deception of the enemy is to, to bring the battle on. But thank God for the righteous because they cry out and God brings deliverance. Now, Paul used it as he referenced in Ephesians chapter 6. And he was talking about putting on the whole armor of God. 6 and 11 as he talked about it. To put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. What he's saying is when you become submersive in the word, when you become submersive by putting on and using all the tools of the enemy, you you fully you fully armed and ready against all the tricks of the enemy. Wow, what do you mean? Every cunning deception and gag the enemy has, the scammer of all scams, when you put on the whole armor, you can see it all. You can see it. It's like having the night vision in the dark of night and all the other tools you need for this battle. And this is why Paul says put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. And of course, the goal of the enemy is specialized with all kinds of cunning tricks. And his biggest weapon is deception. Because once you're deceived, then typically he will attack your belief. And then if he can attack your belief, it's going to create fear. And we know that perfect love casts out all fear. When you're in fellowship with God, you're not going to be fearful. Because you know, this is why Psalms 16 and 11 says, that in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pledges forevermore so notice one of the things that Paul mentioned also in Romans 8 37 where he says he said we're more than we're not just but we are more than through who? through him that loved us we become more than conquerors when we are submerged in the word of God, more than. So God takes pleasure in fighting our battle for us. And we, we see it clearly in the Old Testament over and over again when Israel would follow the principles of the Lord, they were invincible. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9, open the door and remind us. Of course, there are so many other places where it reminds and set the principle I like Deuteronomy as it's again rehearsing some of those guidelines of the covenant. In Deuteronomy 18 and 9 says, when you come into the land, in other words, the land where the enemy had been cast out, those who had operated in rebellion and did every, con every conceivable and unconceivable evil and wickedness by passing their sons and daughters through the fire necromancer, in other words, talking to the dead, and witchcraft, wizardry, all those various guidelines, Israel were prohibited from partaking in any of it. And God made it very clear, when you come into the land, don't do what they did. Don't try to figure out what they did, how they did it, how they worship these idols. Don't be a part of it. If you do what they did, then you will receive the punishment that they received, but yours will be double because you understood this and there was an agreement we had. So, as long as Israel 
as the children of Israel kept their part of the deal, they were invincible. And this is the part that we oftentimes reference from Numbers chapter 23, verses 21 through 23 as well. And we saw a we saw there that Balaam was having some real problems. He couldn't curse God's people. And so what he did, he taught Balak to cast a stumbling block. Well, I can't curse him, but if you can get them to break their covenant, then that's the only way you'll be able to, to cause ills in their life. And so Balak taught, uh, Balaam taught Balak to how to do this, how to cast a stumbling block, get them to break their covenant, get them to breach their contract. If you can breach, if you can get them to breach their contract, then you'll, you'll be able to gain a little bit in this battle against them. One of the things that we see, it talks about it, and, and we see that there is an expiration date, and it's referenced from Isaiah chapter 14, verse 4. And what the prophet was told is, I was just take up this parable. And against this entity who is controlling battle and I believe Daniel he originally was interpreting the dream for, for Nebuchadnezzar and he began to tell Nebuchadnezzar that you're that head of gold so anyway uh, to allow me to, to say it like this the entity that's being control the leader of the Babylonian Empire at that time now this is very interesting in the sense of nations and great nations there is those who have leadership over it and as they progress in their pride they are putting the nail in their own coffin as they progress in their pride and their arrogance and take God out of it every nation which forget God will be is coming down will be destroyed will be cast into hell I believe Psalms 9 and 17 talks about that. So one of the things of the enemy, Isaiah, I believe it was Isaiah 14 and 6, that he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that rules the nation in anger, angry, in anger, he that rules the nation in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. And of course, we see the destruction of the enemy even in our world today and the only one who can hinder you know, the only one who can prevent the chaos of the enemy is the child of God who will walk in the principles and the covenant of God throughout the battles of Israel and we'll get into those dynamics a little later on but throughout the battles of Israel what caused Israel to be undefeatable was those times when they would keep the covenant and would not breach their covenant. And then there were times when Israel were beaten. And all of those times were because they had breached the contract and they had breached the covenant. So what we see here is Isaiah, he's talking about the, there's a place when the leader of Babylon operated in pride and he's no longer is operating under the moral guidelines and principles that governs the world. And, and of course, every time a leader gets in that pers uh, perspective of pride and arrogance, I believe Isaiah 14 and 6 says it well, he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, just has no respect, no regards, but there is an end date coming. And of course, Isaiah 19, I mean, four, I'm sorry, Isaiah 14, and we're, we're talking about Isaiah 14 really began to really give some very good insight in the, the ills of the, the expiration date of the enemy. So here's an angry devil cast down to the earth and what he needs is, again as I pointed out, he needs help from man. He cannot do the things that he's doing unless he can get man to cooperate because he doesn't have the authority until he can get man to agree. One of the things I thought was very interesting in the fourth chapter of Luke and also in the fourth chapter of Matthew, we see 
the enemy, Satan, he tries to make a deal. And as we go back over through history, and this is the thing that makes it very interesting because as in Daniel, we see the rise and fall of various empires, but one of the things that really stood out is not every leader that came on the scene made deals. But so when we look at different leaders which made deals with the enemy, it is these various leaders whose empire, whose nation will be destroyed. And of course, we'll, we'll get into that part as we talk on from, from Revelation. Not only, I believe, Revelation chapter 17, we'll get into that portion as well as we'll begin to, to look at various leaders as he's talking about the seven the heads that he began to explain the seven heads. Every leader which has come on the scene, everyone which has made league with the enemy, their journey has been shortened. Their, their reign has been shortened. And even in the future, we'll, we'll see the manifestation of the enemy trying to totally domin dominate, and we'll, we'll see that as we talk about it in some of the other chapters coming along. What we hear in, as Paul is explaining, 1 Corinthians chapter 55, 22, in the first Adam, all died. And he explained that so in Christ shall all be made alive. We lost everything under the first Adam. And as it appeared, we didn't have a chance at all. All of us were doomed, pulled out of an eternal state into a time state with an expiration date, never to rise again. And then we see the mercy and the grace of God, so loved the world. And we also find the angels desire to look into this mystery. What is it about man? We'll see it in Psalms 8. What is it about man? that thou art so mindful of him. Well, what is it about this man? He broke the rule, he pulled the lid off of the bottle, lost everything. Enemy has the power, he's working in tandem with death, creating carnage all over the world. What is it about man that the, the, the creator of all the universe would make such a huge investment to try to get him out of his dilemma? What is it about man that the creator of all the universe so desire to restore fellowship? What is it about man that the creator of all the universe chooses to provide a way to pull him out of this time state and give him the opportunity to choose to be back into an eternal state? What is it about man that the creator would would make such a huge investment, put it all on the line to restore fellowship. And we can certainly, we'll see that in chapter 22, in verse four, where it talks about his name being written on our forehead and we're able to see him face to face. And as in Revelation 21 and verse four, he's going to wipe all tears from our eyes and there be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Death, sorrow, crying, pain was not God's idea at all. Let's say it again, being a little redundant. Death, sorrow, pain was not God's idea at all. It was man disobedience. Well, we, we say Eve, but he was also the catalyst to get man to eat the fruit and be a partner in the crime. And the world has never been the same. So the angry devil get the opportunity to wreck the world. And we can see, even as I speak, all across this world, the carnage being done by the enemy. Every newborn, every child of God, every individual which allows Christ to come into their life as they learn of him and as they allow God to operate in their life, they can operate with power and authority. 
And Psalms 91 become fully alive in their life as they become submersive in the word. He who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust for surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fire and from the noisome pestilence. And his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Why? Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thine inhabitation. Therefore, no evil shall befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. He will give his angels charges over thee, and they will keep thee in all thy ways. And then, of course, the psalmist went forward and says, and you think about a shepherd person as he's, as he's uh, tending the flock, or tending the sheep, or whatever it is, and, and if you look back in a time of ancient, and, and he says that, that he would give his angels charges over me, and they shall bear Bear thee up in their, in their hands, lest thou dashest thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the ass. Thou shalt trumpet the young lion and the dragon under, under your feet. And he says, because thou hast set thy, because you have set your love upon him, therefore will he deliver. He will set on high. Because, and this is such a, this is an anchor that we can rest upon. That he will set on high because we have known his name. It is true, when we become submersive in the word of God, he will set us on high because we have known his name. When we become submersive in the word of God, no evil shall befall us. And this is how we actually win against an angry devil. When we begin to follow the principles of God, no evil shall befall and neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. And yes, you can tread upon the lion in the attic. And yes, you can trample the young lion and the dragons under your feet. And then, of course, the psalmist went forward enough to say, when you call upon him, he will answer you, and he will be with you in trouble, and he will deliver, and will, with long life will he satisfy. Not only will he deliver, but he will honor, and with long life will he satisfy and show you his salvation. Now, I believe this is a place where we, we progress and as we become submersive in the word of God. This is the place where every Christian should desire to do to learn of him, and as we abide in him and his word abide in us, it allows us when we go to fight against the enemy, we'll be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, we will have on the whole arm of God so that we can withstand all the wiles of the enemy. And when we reach that level of maturity, we become more than conquerors and we also have the power and the authority to have some control, be able to number our days. We also have some control to be able to, in other words, this is what Psalm 119, 109, my life, my soul is in my own hand, but yet I look into your law. So that we have a lot of, a lot of control of, of our destiny as we become submersive in the word of God. That we have already seen, not only teach us how to number our days, but he said, I will honor you and with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. So Jesus said this, and we get ready to, obviously we can't tell it all here, but we want to be able to share with you. Um, but Jesus said this in Mark eight thirty six. He asked this question. He said, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Why? Because, of course, that's the goal of the enemy is to offer you the whole world, offer you anything. Let's make sure you don't become submersive in the word of God. Let's make sure you don't learn of him. Let's make sure the goal of the enemy is to make sure that you're doomed in a time state so that your punishment will be eternal in, a, in, in an eternal state. And God has given us the opportunity to progress from the time state to an eternal state and eternal life. To, to live in an unmeasurable, like eyes haven't seen, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, and it have not entered into the hearts of men 
the thing which God has prepared for those that love him, but it is revealed. And there's only one, it's the way it is revealed is through his spirit. And those who worship him, according to John 4, 24, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God bless him to you, my brothers and sisters. Thank you for this time. And I just want you to hold fast to what you have and don't let anybody steal your crown. It is one of the greatest treasures ever, which has been made available to each of us. And as we operate within the covenant of the Lord, we can be more than conquerors and we can win against an angry devil. God bless us here. Those wherever they are in their homes, wherever they are on the jobs and the cars, healing come forth now. Deliverance come forth now. Breakthrough come forth now. In the mighty name of Jesus, be made whole from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Be made whole. Hallelujah. Be made whole. The blood of Jesus make thee whole. The blood of Jesus makes thee whole from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Be whole in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, and in your spirit. Every shackle be broken now. Every wall come down in your life now. Joy of the Lord come forth. Peace of the Lord come forth. In Jesus' mighty name. And whatever that be, that's a special prayer request. We're standing and we're touching and we're agreeing with those requests now. In Jesus' mighty name. Be it so. Be it so. Be it so. Every wall down in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And those things that we need to pray that the things that we don't know how we pray that the Holy Ghost will intercede in those areas in Jesus mighty name we commit this into the Lord most high and it is so it is so it is so because your eyes is upon the righteous and your ears is open to that cry that whenever the righteous cry you hear it and you deliver it out of all their troubles the angel of the Lord encampers round about them that fear him and delivers them. And we thank you, mighty God, because your word declared that to a thousand shall fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand. It won't come nigh us. We'll see it with our eyes, but it won't happen to us. We thank you. Let, let it be our passion always to be in your secret place. We thank you for the miracles today. Thank you for the healings today. Thank you for the breakthrough today. Even now, as we're touching and agreeing, because your words are not in it to touch and agree, you would give it us. We would stand touch and agree, you would give it us. And we believe your word, we stand upon your word, we turn it down in Jesus' mighty name, and it is so. Hallelujah. It is so. Glory. It is so. Mighty God, thank you. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for breakthrough this day. Thank you for deliverance this day. Thank you for change of heart. Change of mind, change of spirit, change of soul. Unmeasurable is your love. Unmeasurable is your goodness. Unmeasurable. Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty Father, that you love us that much. You give us access, and it is, it is, it is your will to give us the kingdom. And we thank you for that, mighty God. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes, thank you that whenever the righteous call, you hear it and deliver us from all their trouble. Thank you for victory today. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. And it is so. So again, go in peace. Enjoy the blessings of the Lord. He is for you. And it brings some pleasure when God's children operates. When God's children began to utilize those gifts, those ability healing is to teach you bread. And it brings God's pleasure whenever we operate upon his word we take those things that rightfully belongs to us that he has already paid the price for Christ paid the price for it all he was the one that poured out his soul and the death was numbered with the transgressors buried the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors that's the kind of unmeasurable love that Christ has for us and Jesus went poor enough to say evil fathers know how to give good gifts to their kids and how much more would the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask?
scriptures stated in Luke 18 and, and 1 about always to pray and not to pray. And there are times we won't feel like praying. And I can attest that some of my greatest breakthroughs and healing was when I didn't feel like praying. And I had to admit that to the Lord. Lord, here I am. And I don't feel like praying. I really don't even know what to say. And I know I love you. And when those words left my tomb, the Holy Spirit interceded and began to pray and began to interact in things that I didn't know how to say. And one of the greatest breakthroughs, normally 10 minutes of prayer and I'm about done, but this was so awesome and beautiful. Three and a half hours later, after I was done praying, I thought I had only prayed 15 minutes and it's something unique to be in God's presence. And it's available to all of God's children. God has no respect to a person. It is true you draw nigh to him, and he will draw nigh to you. Be blessed, my brothers and sisters. Whatever you do, continue to stand. When you've done everything, that's what Jesus said it does. In 18 and 1, you ought to always pray and not to fail. God bless you. Love you. Until next time, go in victory, go in peace, go in love. In Jesus' name.